Hello and welcome to today's talk. It's Thursday the 6th of October. Now I want to do a bit of a, a data burst today on the UK data and we'll be looking at the United States data as well and hopefully we'll make some uh, inferences from this as to how things are going to go over the next few months. Now last week I forgot to give you the symptoms so I'm going to give you the Zoe study uh, symptoms first of all. These are updated every week and they are very consistent so I have a pretty high degree of uh, confidence in these. So here we are, are here. This is the, the most common symptoms at the moment. So these are people that have tested positive for COVID. So we know that these people have got symptomatic COVID, they've tested positive. So we know that these are genuine symptoms of COVID from a large sample all over the UK. And uh, let's look at it now. So a sore throat is the most common. So if you've got if you've got um, SARS coronavirus 2 infection, there's a 66% probability, if you're symptomatic, that you'll have a sore throat. There's a 54% possibility you'll have a headache. Then runny nose, blocked nose also 53%, interesting. So uh, the nose can become runny or blocked. Of course, it could be runny then blocked afterwards. It, can, it doesn't have to be, you know, people can get both at slightly different phases of the evolution of the condition. Um, cough with no phlegm, so coughing but not coughing anything up, 51%. Sneezing, 47%. Cough with phlegm, 47 Hoarse voice, muscle pains and aches, 31%. Dizziness, 22 uh, Altered smell, down to 19 Swollen neck glands, 19 The lymphadenopathy, the swollen glands in the neck. These are the lymph nodes, actually, not actually glands, that, but everyone calls them glands. Uh, but we should call them nodes. <laughs> uh, chest pain, sore eyes, earache, shortness of breath, that's good, down to 15%. Uh, percent. Uh, chills or shivers indicating a febrile response, fairly low, 15% uh, for uh, chills and shivers. Um, loss of smell altogether down to 13 uh, and uh, fever down to, uh, down to 12%. So there we go, that's the current list of uh, symptoms. They'll be posted, of course, at the top of the description. So you can get them if you want. So if you have those uh, symptoms, be suspicious that you could have, you could have uh, a COVID-19 infection. But as we'll see, common colds are much more expensive. Not much more expensive, much, much more extensive. There's a lot more of them um, in the country at the moment. Now here we see the uh, COVID symptom uh, data here. So this is from uh, the Zoe study. And I, I'm very grateful to the, uh, the Zoe data scientist and Tim Spector for allowing me to uh, present this data first. Is very uh, generous of them. Um, so first of all, we're looking at this incidence of common cold-like uh, features versus um, versus actually COVID-19. So the blue line here is COVID-19 infections, and the orange line is all other respiratory viruses. So we see that while COVID infections have gone up, yes, we also see that common colds are much more common. Slightly coming, starting to come down there, but still quite high. Probably about, well, probably about five times more common at the moment. So if you've got common cold type symptoms in the UK at the moment, the probability is it's a rhinovirus. That's the most common. It could be one of the other coronaviruses as well, but these common cold type viruses. But they can still make you feel pretty grotty for a few days and really quite, well, you've all had colds. But you can be knocked off for a good few days with, with the common cold. Very similar features, of course, to the... Um, SARS coronavirus 2. Although be clear that SARS coronavirus 2 is associated with more serious complications in a minority of people uh, compared to colds. We're not minimising uh, the condition by any means. And I must say the move to endemicity, especially in the American data that we'll look at later, is taking a lot longer th than I thought. It's, this is more of a problem than I expected it to be at this stage. Um, but anyway, that's that's the um, the fact that the common colds are more uh, common uh, than the SARS coronavirus uh, two infections. Now, this is a non-COVID-like illness stratified by age. So what we see here is that um, this is the younger age group here. So they're catching the colds, socialising and at school, and they're bringing it home in the next generation there to have uh, a lot of uh, symptoms. There is the... Uh, their parental generation in green, 35 to 54. So this is the common pattern that we see. Uh, children catch it, socialising, and then spread it to the rest of us. Thank you very much. But it's always been so, and I guess it always always uh, will be. So we're seeing that kind of uh, 
pattern there not surprising at, at all really um, it's what we've uh, what we've expected that's a non uh, non covid cold like illness stratified by age a non covid cold like illness stratified by region where well, we see basically people have got colds all over the country and there's not much difference between uh, uk regions which is a fairly big place so it is a bit surprising but we're basically this is becoming uh, these are becoming symptomatic everywhere now, going back to um, SARS coronavirus 2 particularly, we do see a continued, these are the Omicron spikes of course, but we do see a continued uh, increase. So this is still uh, going up, the number of infections are going up. And that gives us an R value there at the moment of about 1.1. So cases are going up our value is between 1 and, and 1.2, probably around about 1.1. So cases are definitely uh, still going up in the United Kingdom. Now, in the, in the United States, we actually don't have data for symptomatic cases, so we're, we're, we're speculating, but I suspect it's a similar situation in the States. Now, we could argue that being fairly early in the year, um, this is, could be a good thing because people are building up immunity. Uh, for for winter time, especially mucosal compartment immunity, which is so important in respiratory infections. So even though this is bad now, it may take the pressure off hospitals over winter to some extent. Of course, the big unknown uh, for next winter is influenza. Um, how are we going to fare with influenza in the UK and the States and other parts of the world um, if there's a lot of influenza cases? And we've got off pretty lightly for the past few years. Uh, that could be a problem. That's the big unknown, uh, together with ongoing uh, COVID-19, which we're hoping is going to be less, but time will tell. New cases in England, again, similar pattern. They're going up uh, in England, uh, most countries. Uh, now, this is across the this is across the uh, the nation. So we see that. What do we see? We see that uh, Northern Ireland and uh, Scotland are slightly lower cases. Um, but there again, they were slightly higher before, so they've probably built up a bit more immunity. So, But basically, the countries are trending pretty well together in terms of SARS coronavirus to uh, symptomatic infections. And again, across the regions in England, well, we do see that London's quite a bit lower at the moment. Uh, that's the green line there. But there again, London was quite a bit higher here. So again, th this indicates to me that the higher rates in London, uh, well, a few months ago, um, could have built up some immunity, resulting in lower cases now. And I'm hoping this is going to be repeated all over the country um, this, next, uh, this next winter. Uh, daily incidence, SARS coronavirus 2 infection rates across uh, age groups. So uh, these are new cases across uh, age groups. And again, we see that the younger ones were getting more. But again, we see that is starting to level off now, presumably as more immunity uh, is developed. But the parental generation, as we see, is still uh, going up. Again, not surprising because there's some delay from infection to uh, being symptomatic. Now, this, this data that the ZOE study gives, and I talked to the ZOE scientists about this last week, they're fully aware that this is pessimistic. So these are the these these are the number of cases of people who would expect to be getting long COVID as of today, as a result of the incidence of new cases of COVID nineteen, but it's based on the prognostications from twenty twenty one data, and we know that the Omicron is not so severe. So uh, the, these really are the worst case scenarios, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, long COVID. But we are seeing more people still developing long COVID, and as we've looked at from other videos, this is a real problem. Uh, sequelae from COVID um, is going to be with us for some time, I'm afraid. But those numbers are pessimistic. Hopefully we're not getting new daily cases of long COVID, 4,000. I would hope it's a lot less than that. Um, but um, as I say, based on 2021 data. So that, that's the uh, COVID study and the, uh, and the symptoms. Now let's look at the, uh, just a couple of things, um, Professor Spector's comments. Uh, while COVID is still increasing at a very high rate, uh, colds are rising even faster. Um, so plenty of people feeling a bit under the weather with colds and uh, COVID at the moment in the UK. <clears throat> the pattern shows strong links to kids returning to school each year. 
yes, we know this only too well. Uh, maybe we lost a bit of our immunity uh, over the restrictions in uh, the COVID period. And this is why it is a bit concerning that if we've got reduced uh, resistance to infection for rhinoviruses, for common colds, then I guess we, I don't think I've been exposed to an influenza virus for some years now. So my immunity is going to be reduced, increasing the risk of influenza for, um, for next winter, I think. But we don't know. Hopefully there won't be, uh, if the virus isn't around, of course, we won't get it. We'll have to see. Um, but it is an unknown. Now, 14-day uh, trends in the state, so cases down 23%. Of course, that's based on testing, so it's not reliable, but it's a very rough indicator. Test positivity is 9.1%, which is down, but still fairly high. Now, this indicates to me, this high test positivity rate, or relatively high test positivity rate in the States, indicates to me there's still one heck of a lot of circulating virus in the States, because a lot of the tests are coming back positive, really quite high. So let's just look at the uh, let's look at that figure there. So um, this so we see the test positivity rate is coming down. It's about level here, but it, but it is it is it has been of course much higher, um, but it's coming down now. So it's trending down over the last few weeks, which is is encouraging, but still one heck of a lot of it around. That's still a lot of uh, cases. Uh, hospitalised, uh, people actually in hospital, 27,000. This was actually the number as of the 5th of October. Uh, down 12% on the two weeks. And here we see the trend there. This is the intensive care admissions. Now, still high compared to the UK, but hospital admissions overall going down, which is encouraging to see. Uh, ICUs are down, but still relatively high compared to other countries, such as, as the UK. And it's been chronically high in the States for a long time, uh, as we've talked about, probably mostly due to the uh, large amount of comorbidities in the States, people who get it, um, especially if they've got poorly managed comorbidities, hypertension, obesity, uh, uh, insulin resistant diabetes particularly, um, and there's plenty of it. Um, the United States needs a root and branch reform of its nutrition. Uh, the quality of food in the United States in terms of the amount of processed food is not good, to be quite honest. Um, a lot of foods contain more carbohydrates and sugar and processed fats than they need. Um, there really needs to be a cultural change because I really think that's what's accounting for a lot of what we're seeing here. And of course, that's transposing into human pain, suffering and death. Um, if this is, acts as a wake up call, that would be great. I suspect it won't, but um, it would be good if it did. And then uh, finally, deaths in the States. Um, uh, well, there's still, still 391 per day. It's still quite high. Um, pe people are sort of, um, you know, saying this is kind of, you know, the, the pandemic's largely been ignored in the States, but <clears throat> still a reasonable high death rate. Very sad to, very sad to see. <coughs> um, Keep clicking the wrong one today. There we go. Want that one. Um, so, but the deaths are down, but kind of leveling out. So this is kind of a bit of a, a bit of a plateau period here, really. And we're seeing this kind of um, levelish bit here. Let's hope that starts to go down. But that's the trend in the states. Now, um, just before we finish, the Zoe Health Study, um, the. It, it is, I'll just play you the video clip actually because I've, I've been informed now that the app and everything is the same for the States as the UK. There we go, hope you heard that okay. Um, 
so it's just mass, mass, mass data. It tells us all sorts of things we wouldn't know about otherwise. And of course, it is a, uh, a relatively uh, low budget way of collecting very good quality healthcare data that's not based on randomized controlled trials, which may be partly controlled by outside agencies. So um, that was today's data. Um, can't really form a conclusion really because we've got too many unknowns. The big unknown that is a concern at the moment is influenza over winter. But we'll be keeping an eye on it as always so you're as up to date as I am and thank you for watching and thank you to the Zoe data scientists for allowing me to share their data.